This is 1051 Care of HLP Arcado Radio Free Humble. My name is Eric Flaherty, and you are listening to Debate in the News. Joining me via Zoom is my co host, Dr. Aaron Donaldson. Thanks for coming on. Ayrton, it's really, really great to be here. I'm very, very excited for this show. Uh, we would like to begin by acknowledging that we are on the land of the Wiat peoples, which includes the Wiat tribe, Bear River Rancheria, and Blue Lake Rancheria. Arcata is known as Gudini, meaning over in the woods or among the redwoods. The persistence of the Wiat peoples to remain in relationship with these lands despite their attempted genocide compels us to spread awareness to our inner and extended communities regarding the true history of this space. We strive to hold ourselves accountable and others accountable for the continuation of colonial acts which neglect to include the voices and needs of these tribes while remembering to lead with compassion. One of the ways that we are very excited to try to do that today is to dedicate our entire show uh, this week leading us up to the 4th of July um, celebration that our nation has every single year with a conversation about settler colonialism. Um, Roxanne Dunbar Ortiz in An Indigenous People's History of the United States points out that we celebrate the 4th of July without a hint of tragedy, with no sorrow at all. And that's remarkable if you know your history. And so we're here uh, today with just a very distinguished panel of guests that we'd like to um, you know, have them introduce themselves to lead us on a conversation about settler colonialism and decolonization. Uh, we talked before the show about how just there's a lot going on right now that intersects with this conversation. So we think it's going to be really, really great. So um, just real briefly, if you folks could introduce yourselves to our audience, we'd like to start with you, um, Dr. Risling Baldy. Go ahead. Uh, hey, young everyone. I'm Dr. Kutcher Risling Baldy. I am Hoopa Yurk and Karuk, enrolled in the Hoopa Valley Tribe, um, born and raised here in Humboldt County, and uh, am right now the Associate Professor and Department Chair of Native American Studies, and really honored to be on this um, discussion today with my colleagues and good friends. Hi, everybody. I'm uh, Dr. Caitlin Reed. I'm an assistant professor in the Native American Studies Department at Humboldt State. I am a member of the Yurok tribe, and my research tends to focus on settler colonial resource extraction and waves of ecological violence that are then paralleled on indigenous communities. Thank you for having me. My name is Kayla Begay. I come from the Hoopa Valley, um, the big house at Taikamistin, which is the acorn stirring place. Um, my background is in linguistics. I'm assistant professor in Native American Studies at Humboldt, and um, my research is in language resurgence, revitalization, reclamation, and I specialize in languages of Northern California. Okay, so thank you all for introducing yourselves. Uh, so I guess just to start off, basically, since we brought up that we're going to be talking about settler colonialism, what is settler colonialism, and how would you, uh, and how do you usually break it down for your students? I can try to to begin. Um, settler colonialism describes a both a historical and ongoing process of land dispossession. Um, so. Most people in like general education and public education like learn about imperialism, right? That for some reason Europe got to go around and like take a bunch of stuff and people um, from throughout the world to accumulate wealth. Settler colonialism, on the other hand, describes a situation where a power is not only going in to take stuff, but they also want to make that place their home and people already live there. Right. And so if you want to be the rightful owner of a place, you have to do and a whole bunch of people already live there. You then have to go do a whole bunch of stuff. So it makes it seem like it's OK. And people grow up living in that system or that societal organization. And they're not like morally outraged constantly. Right. And so you need to be fed historical narratives that work to justify the existence of the United States. Um, that's a really broad, um, just kind of overview. I'm happy to kick it to somebody else if they want to chime in with some more details. I, I think what I'll add to that is, so when we're talking about settler colonialism, we're really pulling from a scholar whose name is Patrick Wolf. That's W-O-L-F-E. Um, and he's really looking at settler colonialism as an ongoing series of systems that exist even to this day. And he wants to point out to people it is not an event that happened. It's actually a structural system that exists to make people sort of believe that, there, that the existence of the settler state is natural and normal and the way that we're all supposed to live. And so when we talk about settler colonialism, 
in our classes, a lot of it is to kind of clarify for people the things that you've been learning, uh, what, what Dumba Ortiz talks about as master narratives are really set up to give you this idea that these things are, are okay. And yet we all kind of live in this existence where we know that they're not. And we kind of, and that is really a difficult space to be in where we kind of go, well, that doesn't seem right. But we learn to internalize it from very young ages. And we start talking about how they do these narratives of how we're supposed to be, feel about the settler state from the time that you're very young, like first grade, second grade. Uh, we approach it in my class through like the songs that we would have to sing about the United States, the way that it kind of like makes your brain think about like this land is also my land or like we actually belong here. Or, this is my country where the pilgrims died, right? And so we start to go like, this happens when you're very little and then they do it to you in like the fourth and fifth grade and then they keep through high school so that by the time you get to college, and you have one of us standing in front of you going, actually, that's not the case at all. Here's what really happened. It, all, it feels like a, like a gut punch, but also like it can't possibly be true. And then you start to see the way everything's set up, every statue, every monument, everything's set up to make you believe these narratives of um, exceptionalism and greatness and that somehow this country was destined to become, like we had a manifest destiny to make this thing happen. So I think the way that I approach this in the classroom is I like maybe draw a couple of diagrams and it, they hit the points that people are saying um, before me, Kacha and Caitlin, but um, basically we'd have like the metropole, which would be the colonial motherland that's sending people to uh, build colonies. And that would be, you know, a direction one way from the metropole to the colonies, but then in the other direction back, there's an arrow where, um, uh, resources are taken from that colony, that land, and it's all for the benefit of the metropole. Indigenous peoples are there, and they're used as labor. And this is the way that um, with British colonization, European colonization, how things were in the world for one-third of the population um, up until 1945, in which the United Nations was... Um, form for the process of decolonization, right? Um, in which then we get this narrative of independence, um, different lands that are then indigenous peoples are able to, to govern themselves. Um, the difference with settler colonialism is instead of just sending uh, folks over and then those resources back to the metropole, um, people come to stay, as, as Caitlin says and has said, um, but then the process, uh, in that process, they're disrupting systems and ways of life with just regular colonization, right? But with settler colonization, uh, you have erasure of indigenous people, you have genocide, you have policies of removal. And it's, and they're, na they're national policies where indigenous people are removed violently from the land. And then uh, from there, you know, the, the resources are serving this new structure and system. And again, it's not just an event in time, which I think I first learned about settler colonialism um, by accident. A, a student from India came um, when I was working at a cultural center and asked me, you know, we have post-colonialism. What, what does it mean to be Native American in the United States? And we have this post-colonial thing going on in India. Uh, what about Native American people? And I had to answer and, and think about it and said, well, we, it, it's never happened. And what I was missing was this concept of settler colonialism, where it's a structure, it's not an event in time, and um, there's heavy indigenous erasure and policies that support that. One of the phrases that was very, very useful for me to learn, and this is in Dunbar Ortiz's book and multiple other books, is the phrase active forgetting. Um, scholars talk about how we have to like actively forget what actually happened. Um, Kutcha describes this kind of gut punch when we show up uh, to college and learn that it's not nearly as you know simple. Uh, we all knew it wasn't as simple, but 
so many things are implicated. Every statue of Abraham Lincoln, the song, this land is my land, this land is your land, which famously is like a progressive union tune. Like all of this stuff is deeply implicated in both the kind of ideology um, and ongoing practice, the regular practice of not having the real conversation and actively forgetting that conversation. This speaks to um, what we in debate call like the apologetic or the script the front line, the first wave of so-called nonsense that you will get when you just try to have a normal conversation. Like we're just going to have a facts-based conversation and you're going to have to deal with people saying that you hate all white people, that you hate everything about freedom. It just turns into this spectacular display. And for me, one of the more interesting apologetics that really speaks to what Dr. Begay was just touching on is how it's not, you know, it it's ongoing. It, it, we speak of settler colonialism as if it has happened. Whenever we talk about it as past tense, that is a way that we apologize for it and, and like try to make it erased and go away. What other kinds of apologetics would you folks want to speak to? Dr. Reed, yeah. Um, in addition to Dunbar Ortiz's active forgetting, um, there's a, an amazing poet, Simon Ortiz. Um, and he, I don't know if he coined this phrase, but like he uses it in his work, historical amnesia right this like collective forgetting right and like this and like how how this place was invaded right like we have this collective forgetting that the gold rush was a genocide sponsored by the state here in california but to get to your question of apologetics um the one i see students are less likely to like bring this up in the classroom where I see this is on like the comment section of every article ever on the internet. Um, and this notion that native peoples were very primitive, were very, were savage, were continuously going to war with one another, right? That were cannibals, right? When we, when you actually like look at some of the paintings and like drawings of native, of like European representations of native peoples that are circulating throughout Europe as people are invading the continent, right? They're showing us as cannibals and like eating people that were naked, that were just these like random hunter gatherers walking through the woods, grabbing a berry here um, and like have no sort of sophisticated land management regimes. And that because we were in this savage primitive state, we should be grateful that Europeans came to take our land and offer us civilization. And so that I think is strategically ingrained in people over their entire education and existence within the settler state. And so that initial refusal to believe that native peoples had complex civilizations, societies, right? I always think it's really strange when people come to me with like, these people were like uncivilized, like people who have like have languages and religions and political structures, right? And so like using this civilization narrative as justification for settler colonial land dispossession, I think is one of the first ones that I typically have to encounter with folks, but uh, I'll let other people share their experiences with that. Well, I just, I want to add really quickly to that is it's a really interesting um, theoretical and philosophical discussion to have as an indigenous person in Native American studies or indigenous studies, because we could spend time now in this show going, but let me list for you all the ways that we meet the criteria for what it means to be civilized prior to what we call colonization, right? But what when you're looking at indigenous scholars, they're saying prior to invasion, because we were really invaded. That's what's happening. And we need to start using words that matter instead of sort of being like, this is pre-colonization. This is pre-contact. This is, right? Uh, it wasn't contact. It was an invasion. And they they had a very particular setup, like uh, the settler colonial like um, methodologies. Those are worldwide. We're not saying that this happened just in the Americas. This happened everywhere. They have a very set, structured system of how you do how you do this invasion so that you get out of it what you want which is like resources and land and it all comes down to the land and so we could spend time now and i could go through like all the different ways that we meet the criteria of civilization that would show people oh my gosh how could they ever claim that this place was empty land what they call terra nullius right or wilderness they couldn't but at the same time, I hate getting into that debate with people because I shouldn't have to justify our humanity to get people to understand why our invasion and genocide was wrong in the first place. 
Like we shouldn't have to get into all the things that indigenous peoples um, contribute to our democracy that we know today, to all the ways in which we contributed to the roads that we drive on to this very day. The roads are based on our roads, right? In order to say, this is why you should think about what happened. Because in reality, no matter what I tell you, we were always human beings. We were always people who were living here. There's no justification for coming in and genociding people. No matter how primitive or different you think they are, I shouldn't have to say, let me show you how we were so much like you that you should now feel, you should feel bad that that, that genocide was the, like how this country was built. You should also think about what that means in terms of how do we move forward and how do we break down those structures so that we actually start to address the fundamental issues of like anti-racism uh, and like anti-blackness and all the things that we're trying to talk about today. So that I'm, I'm wondering if people who are listening are going to be like, well, what are some of these things? And I was like, we could go into it. But then part of me was like, I don't want to. I don't want to have to justify our humanity to say we shouldn't have been invaded this way. And they can go take a Native American studies course at Humboldt State. Well, like, I, I kind of also have a question, uh, like, on, like, and how is Euro-American colonization different from the subjugation of people throughout history? Because, I mean, throughout human civilization, like, people have been conquering each, uh, each other. So it's kind of like, how is, how is, like, the col uh, colonialism different from that? Because, I mean, if we look back, this has been happening for thousands of years and not even counting indigenous, like back in, in Asia and Europe. Uh, and uh, Dunbar Ortiz writes about this in her book, An Indigenous People's History of the United States. And she talks about the waves of like how European people have been colonizing each other and using really, really violent um, means to do that for, for a very, very long time, right? And so like, it's not as if people just showed up in what they call the new world right um and like decided they were going to start doing these things like they had been undergoing violent processes of colonization in europe for for centuries prior to that also like the initial people like colonizing like like the the first ones to like come over on boats like that's not a super glamorous like position those people had also like experienced land as possession but then like the problem comes when they then they come here and they use like religious beliefs and like rhetoric of savagery to then inflict some uh, more violence against other peoples right and so it's not there's a lot of scholars that write about colonization that's happening in europe right but the the i'd say to get to your question here what the difference is is that they need to construct a society that has like written narratives where europe where indigenous peoples have disappeared right and so like what the difference here is that when we talk about this ongoing process is that the rhetorics of settler colonialism need to be reproduced every single day and so like in my work i look at, like land and like private property and how that's a terrible idea um but like every day that like green diamond or the redwood national park wakes up with the deed to Yurok ancestral territory that's like the process of settler colonial um land dispossession that is being reenacted and so like the difference here is that like indigenous people survive this genocide and we're still here ask, demanding our land back right um, and so I think that is a critical difference also I would say that Euro-American settler colonization here and what we now call the continental United States the other thing they have to do is lump us all together right as this one monolithic entity called Native Americans when in reality like we're talking about political relationships with like 500 different nations right and so like we also we are nations within the United States. And so like we have sovereign status. And so I would say that is another like absolutely critical difference when we say, when we're starting to talk about like, no, you violated this legal agreement that you made that was like codified in international law, right? Um, and because you violated all of these political negotiations, like legally, you should be giving us land back. And I would also say that the legal justification used by Euro-Americans within the United States is based on white supremacy, right? It's the doctrine of discovery. It's the idea that white people can find and take stuff away from people who aren't white and Christian. Um, and so I would say there are a lot of differences, but I would say those are some of like the main ones that come to mind for me. I think it's worth echoing um, what we heard from Dr. Rizingbaldi about 
how we point our attention in the wrong places when we dwell on the apologetic. In debate, we talk a lot about how an argument is a distraction, a very meaningful distraction. And people will say like, I'm just, listen, I'm just playing devil's advocate. I just want to, let's just like have it out. Like teach me something. You know, uh, Dr. Reed's saying you can take a Native American studies class as a kind way of reminding people that your education is your own responsibility. And for people to come with the kind of, um, you know, grossly inaccurate history that they have, and yet this pride that suggests that we should be able to just hash out whether it was a genocide with folks who are enduring genocide is, um, I just think that's really uh, unique. And I think it's really um, fascinating the way that you described that. You've all got obviously interesting research that you take on um, I briefly just wanted to touch on um, We Are Dancing for You, this wonderful book that Dr. Risling Baldy has recently put out because we read it in my gender communication class. And um, we talked about how understanding even something like heteronormative patriarchy really does have to start with a conversation about settler colonialism. And so it's like you've got research that is specific to this particular and wide sweeping process but it touches on so many other things. And I'm sure that that's true for all of your research. Um, could you folks just kind of maybe take us through as briefly as possible some of the work that you do and maybe describe some of the ways that it implicates some of these other conversations going on? Well, I mean, since you, since you brought the book up, I'll say that that, that book was um, a, a several years of work at, with my community and community members to try to talk and tell our own story about the you know the resurgence of, of one of our ceremonies that was very i think particular to understanding how we are going to address the ongoing issues of genocide settler colonialism healing wellness and mental health all the things um and i will say that throughout that process one thing that i really learned about was how much we as indigenous peoples need to be the ones telling our own stories because that is what's going to help to push back against this idea that they, we don't have the stories to tell, that we somehow didn't, you know, they, they sort of refer to us as like prehistoric, like before history, but we have such a rich history and stories to tell. And then for so long, stories just have been told about us, not like from us. And those stories were told about us to uphold the system and because not trying to break a system apart, but to uphold it. And so I think, setting forward this work like the work that i i do is really about like how are we going to be the ones telling those stories we're, we're all done with people telling stories about us there's not really an excuse anymore people have to come to us for our histories our stories our interpretations our research because we are out there doing it and i would argue we've always been doing it when people tell me like well you know i'll go do talks I'm like well catch a History is written by the victors. History is written by the ones who win, right? And I'm always like, no, it's not. The history that they force in schools and textbook is written by the victors, even though they didn't win anything. We're not done fighting. Um, but second of all, they, we've always been writing our own histories. You just don't, you just haven't paid attention to it. Like we've always been pushing back. There's always people who were writing, speaking, singing, you know, like doing, like holding on to whatever they could to pass on that knowledge from the very beginning. So from the very beginning, we were saying, you don't get to be the only ones telling stories about us. We are going to tell the stories about us. I think our generation now is coming in and helping to tell those stories. And I have to say that like with the book, um, it was the, the, the women who sat with me to tell those stories. That's who I wanted to say are the are the historians and the and the theor the theory makers and the ones that are gonna like decide what it is we want people to know about our peoples because that's who should have been at the forefront of that in the first place it should have never been like white dudes trying to get tenure who were the ones telling these stories it should have always been us and so now how do we help it to be us and so um dr begay is actually in that book like uh, she's like central to that space in terms of the work that she does but also the fact that in like living her life she's been able to speak to what it means to come from place and i think i see that a lot in the work we do what it means to come from place what it means to come from the place that we come from what it means to know the land the way that we know it and to know it through 
our research, our language, our songs, our ceremony, that's when you're talking about why this connection to land is so important. And when we're talking about settler colonialism, Dunbar Ortiz is always saying, it always comes down to the land. It's always about the land. It's always forever been about the land. And I can say the same thing about us. It's true. But for us, it's always been about our responsibility to the land, our ties to the land, our relationship to it, and who we want to be because of it and how we want to care for it. And that's what I think we're going to bring to this conversation that's very different than like a historian, anthropology, like, uh, you know, social science kind of approach is this relationship that we have. I know we've got other folks that want to jump in. I just wanted to say our conversation, Kutcha, about indigenous futurities and all the sci-fi titles that you gave me. Um, you were talking about Sense of Place. You gave me the title This Place, I think by Elliot. Is that right? Her last name, right? Um I've ordered a bunch of these. I'm just really excited about them. There's a whole lot of these stories out there that folks can look to. Does anyone else want to jump in on this? Just kind of describe your research and some of the, um, you know, maybe other concepts that it touches into. So my, I, I, I situate my work within like indigenous environmental studies or indigenous environmental justice. And so like, necessarily asking the question like what does environmental justice look like for native communities like you necessarily have to talk about land theft uh settler colonialism and like the contamination of our lands and so when we talk about the way settler colonialism is this ongoing structure like within my work i make the argument that like resource extraction and the contamination of our lands depletes the integrity of that land and like the things we're supposed to do with it and the, like the, the the ways we're supposed to care for it and so in that way um there's a whole bunch of other ways too but like in my work i look at that's how for me I see settler colonialism being reenacted every day. And so I'm currently working on a, um, a project called, uh, tentatively called from like gold rush to green rush, thinking about the ecology of settler colonialism in California. And so like the very first thing like that we need to talk about is that settler colonialism has a particular orientation to land. Right, as Kutcher was just speaking, like we understand land as like a relative it's like it has its own agency, right? And so, like, um, there's uh, there's this great um, indigenous Australian scholar named C. F. Black. She wrote a she's like a legal theorist. She wrote this book called "The Land Is the Source of the Law," um, and in that book, she's like, "How like naive and arrogant do human beings have to be to think they get to create environmental laws and create the rules by which an ecosystem is going to operate?" And so, like in myriad iterations, indigenous peoples have teachings about how to take care of the places that they've always lived in right and so and when you violate those natural laws they have natural repercussions right the fish kill that happened in the Klamath River largest one in like human history um, and so that with this orientation of land not as a relative not as something with agency not that something that you exist in a reciprocal relationship that you are responsible for instead within a settler colonial orientation it is dead it is an object right it is private property it is real estate and it, like it is, it exists to be sold, exchanged, purchased. It exists to be exploited for wealth accumulation for the purposes of human beings, right? And so this orientation to land, this relationship to land, like I argue it's like a toxic relationship. And like who would want to be in a relationship like that where you are viewed as property, where you are owned, where you don't get any decision making and what happens? Right, um, and so of course everything's being depleted rapidly, and we have like this huge climate change that indigenous peoples often bear the brunt of the ecological consequences of that. But it, long story short, what I try to argue in the book is that settler colonial relationships to land, which get mar like written off as like natural and normal, right? Nobody grows up thinking like, oh yeah, duh, land is private property, of course, right? That's not the way it's always been that's not the way it could be or should be right and so i argue that that fundamental hierarchical relationship with land and like more than human relatives creates a like just descending like s slide of doom right um that's not I, but i i we need to re-envision what relationships to land could be and so for an indigenous environmental justice 
you need to one think about like returning stolen lands but also reconfiguring that relationship and that framework in which we understand land right and it needs to be able to decide like if you're going to dump oil in the water and my guess is like probably no don't do that uh, i'll i'll uh, quit talking <laughs> the sending slide of doom like that's what climate change feels like to me i think that's a fair characterization if that's what you're talking about i don't know uh Dr. Begay, would you like to speak just a bit to some of the research that you do? Yeah, so um, my background, as I mentioned, is in linguistics, but I came at it backwards <laughs> as uh, a learner of language as opposed to just studying the structures. Um, from the time I was little, I got to be around um, Hupa language speakers, which was a little unusual for my age, my generation. Uh, as a millennial, um, access to language is, is not uh, easily had for very many people. Um, but I got into linguistics, and I, um, it relates to colonization, for me at least, in that, you know, first and foremost, that was another source of extraction. Uh, linguists, anthropologists came in and were doing um, uh, salvage ethnographies and salvage uh, linguists, to, because we were supposed to be disappearing, right? <laughs> Never mind that they're not speaking about the horrible conditions in boarding schools or um, the policies that are making us um, have a lot of death at the time. And from there, um, I guess in my thinking about uh, colonization and settler colonialism is that um, with impositions of colonial systems, uh, that means that our food systems, our medicine, our um, relationship to land uh, was targeted, right? And the point at which that uh, also affects languages is that our languages were targeted because our languages are that connection. And so, you know, the fact that um, many young people haven't had access to language is because of that colonization and settler colonialism, that system of erasure, and languages were targeted. Um, and so from that, you know, when we talk about uh, reclaiming or, well, yeah, reclaiming our relationship to land, that happens very easily through our languages in that, you know, if I'm learning about relationships to land, you know, for example, ninisan is the word, ninisan is the word for land in Hupa. Um, I'm taught that, for example, if I'm reading stories or even you know, if it's passed down orally, um, that you know, you, everywhere you go, you have to introduce yourself if you've never been there before and other people's lands. You don't just go there <laughs> and without permission, right? And, and I'm speaking on We Out Land today, and I'm very cognizant of that, right? Um, but it goes further that uh, if I'm lost, for example, it's uh, the word that comes to mind is ninisan dohwostzit. And it's not that I don't know the land and I'm therefore lost, it's that the land doesn't know me. And that tells you that the land is a, has agency and has as a mind and is, is a force, right? And, and we don't, we're not taught that in English, really, necessarily, in everyday speaking. Um, and when we think about this word, um, settler colonialism, or colonization in English, if I had to translate it into Hupa, it's this thing that we're always worried, um, warned about as Hupa people, which is Ninasan uh, Twindaya of Tuf, which is land spoiling. That's why we do our ceremonies, is to prevent land spoiling. And it's not just land spoiling, but it's, um, you know, sacrilegious behavior. It's not, you know, living in good relationship with everybody. It's not just, it's, it, the word itself has ninasan in it, but it's, it's everything. And so um, when we talk about settler colonialism, it's this thing we were warned, warned about and how do we uh, dismantle that or, or begin to understand how other systems can be? Well, we can go to our languages and look at the truth there. And it's, it's just there, you just scratch the surface. I study rhetoric and we look at the way that language works and the way that it orients and relates us to the things that we talk about. And that has always been one of the lessons that's been, you know, very real to me. Um, when you look at settler colonialism and how it was 
very systemic. As you say, languages were targeted. They were, they, they were wiped out on purpose because they knew that that was technology that threatened the settler colonial master narratives in the state that they're trying to build. Um, and it's, you know, really remarkable um, to see the resilience of the communities with these languages in particular. Um, and I think that it's um, a valuable reminder that a lot of folks, you know, will overlook. They'll say that this is something that's lost, that it's like, it's not lost. There are definitely still folks that are doing this work and you just have to kind of seek it out. We have just a little bit of time here before we go to our break. And in the production meeting, just before we started, we had said that we wanted to try to spend just a little bit of time talking about how some of this touches on some of the stuff that we're seeing in the news right now with regards to all of the statues that are coming down, with regards to the police violence um, movements that we're seeing in Black Lives Matter and all of that kind of stuff. Um, did anyone want to kind of spend, you know, a few minutes just kind of touching on some of that? Because the, the, the connections are definitely there, I think. Yeah, you know, I, I think when we start looking at one of the reasons why this time is so important, uh, I think for everyone, is when you're looking at settler colonialism as the structure that you know is what we're living under right now you have to acknowledge that there are very particular ways in which indigenous peoples are targeted for elimination and genocide and that black peoples are targeted for enslavement and dispossession and they're targeted in this you know in this ways of like the being hyper visible and so what we see is that this settler colonial structure relies on the um the implementation of labor from far away in part because they want to settle here and if they settle here they can't they have they find very quickly that enslaving indigenous peoples becomes a very difficult process because we know the land better we are here already we have whole set systems but also when they first get here they are not i mean we tell this story is like if they get here and suddenly they're like, we totally know how to live here. We actually know exactly what we're doing. But most of the time they have no idea what they're, do they're doing and have no idea how to live here. And they rely on indigenous peoples a lot. And they approach them as like with a, a great sort of like partnership and reverence, at least in words and names, they try to build these relationships. But what they need to uphold their system is labor. And they're not gonna be able to rely on indigenous peoples for labor, so they import enslaved labor. And so you're talking about this system being built on the backs of the death of indigenous peoples, the enslavement of black peoples. So the freedom, the, the liberation from colonization and settler colonialism is not gonna come if one group is, is liberated and another is not. Like the two of us, we all have to work together to make that happen. And the structure is not gonna falter. Like I, I used this explanation the other day where I was like, look, for I would argue 500 years since the very first day, we've been chipping away at the stone wall that is settler colonialism. We've been standing there like we're going to get rid of this thing and we're going to do it chip by chip if that's what it takes. And we can get little chips out of it every once in a while. And then over here, other people have been chipping away at it too. And I think what Black Lives Matter can come in and do for us is to be like, ooh, what if we all chipped at the same spot for just a minute? and just came together to chip together at this giant stone wall that is settler colonialism, it's gonna fall a lot faster when we're doing this together. Because we have the same kinds of stories that we need to tell and we need to be the ones telling those stories because our lives are not going to matter until we are the ones setting that narrative. So let's do it together. And I think I'm seeing so much support for that. I, I've been listening to as much as I can. And what I hear is people going, yes, we're doing this movement because of this, this, and this. And we cannot forget about indigenous peoples and the ways that they fit into this. And we cannot forget that these are the same types of systems that we are trying to struggle against together. So I think it's a really important moment to understand, like we live here in this space, this settler colonial like, system is trying to push us apart from each other, us coming together. That's the most powerful thing that we can do right now because they, they have been trying to keep us away from each other, knowing that the strength that comes from that could change everything. It could change everything that we see about how the world works. Uh, to jump off of that, I wanna um, 
kind of give like a little tiny um, history lesson to kind of go with this, this like triad, like of white supremacy, right? Uh, where you're destroying indigenous lands with enslaved labor um, to like feed the capitalist settler state, right? Um, Cheryl Harris wrote like an essay back in the early nineties in the Harvard Law Review called Whiteness is Property. And in that essay, she examines like the socially constructed racial formations of native peoples alongside black peoples in the United States, right? And so blood quantum, which is how native identity is measured and quantified by the United States federal government, right, is like forever shrinking. It only gets smaller, right? So the purpose of that is like you decrease the population of native peoples that opens up land for you to take, right? Versus black people who are, their identity is quantified and measured by the one drop rule right? Like a complete opposite logic of like categorizing race, but like both are constructed to meet the needs of a white supremacist settler state because you want as much labor as possible, right? So one drop, you have no political autonomy agency and you become the property of white people, right? Um, and so in categorizing native peoples and black peoples in these disparate ways, they're both able to feed the needs of the settler state, but also to create like different distance and separation um and so i see and like this gets played out over and over and over again and so when i'm like currently researching the cannabis industry right and so i see this exact same triad of white supremacy play out today so like right now you have a ton of black and brown bodies that are still incarcerated right in for uh for cannabis related charges you have indigenous lands that are being destroyed and dewatered to grow cannabis and then i like, get the top of this white supremacy pyramid right you have largely white people who are making profit off of this industry right and so like when we're talking about how settler colonialism is a structure that negatively impacts all people of color like we and we say that it's ongoing like these are the ways that it's reproduced today um and it explains why people are so upset with like literally every presidential statue. Like if you want to do history right, you will acknowledge that it is complex. And that means that it's going to be pretty hard to idolize literally any human being and definitely a president of the United States of America. And a lot of people get upset with like Abraham Lincoln statues coming down. And it's like, well, let's learn about Lincoln's role in Manifest Destiny. And let's learn about Lincoln's policies with indigenous folks out West. And um, we... Yeah, and uh, um, if, you, if your viewers or listeners haven't seen Dakota 38, it's a free documentary um, on YouTube, and that'll help you understand why Native people aren't Lincoln's biggest fan. Yeah, I mean, and that, that one was for me, like, I was this big Civil War nut growing up, and I just ate up the settler histories of who this person was, and he's, like, made out to be the best person in the world. And in many ways, he was a very powerful speaker and a meaningful individual, but his practices and policies are just devastating. And the fact that we don't memorialize memorialize the victims of that and instead put him on our currency says a lot about that kind of active forgetting and narrativizing. Yeah, Dr. Begay. You I just want to add that I think in Haudenosaunee language is in culture um, that every president from George Washington to Barack Obama to now Trump is referred to in the language as town destroyer. Mm. And that's just the word for president. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, a lot of folks are asking, uh, you know, like exasperatedly whether or not Mount Rushmore is next. And it's like, yeah, let's talk, let's, let's look at that because that's another one that really, when you learn the history of the artist, the particular presidents that they picked to put on that particular mountain, wh why they picked it and where they picked it. Um, it's not just towns, it's whole sides of mountains, like very sacred places that just get wiped out for the sake of decoration. And that's that narrative again. It's that master narrative again of, you know, whose land this is and, what stories it tells. Well, um, we've had a really, really great conversation about settler colonialism so far. We're about to turn to decolonization and what we do next. We've got like maybe one or two minutes. Is there anything else that you folks would like to just kind of cap off this first conversation with, with regards to like just acknowledging the kind of ideology and practice that active forgetting that we're describing at the top of this episode? I did want to say, you know, one thing I talk to students about a lot in my classes is um, I call it the seven stages of settler colonial grief. And I kind of talk to them a lot about the experience that they're about to have in the classroom, which I think happens the more people get interested in learning more, they go through these stages of grief 
They've been taught to internalize the sort of hero settler, this idea of freedom and like all the buzzwords, right? Like, uh, and wh who we're supposed to be. And then I come in and I'm like, by the way, it's all a lie. Also, here's all the bad stuff. Also, here's these things you need to know. And I watch them go through the stages of grief. And so they begin with denial. They'll come up and they'll just be like, that's not true. That can't possibly be true. If that's true, everybody's lying. And I'm like, yep, that's what happened. Uh, they will often then go into bargaining where they will start asking me questions like, well, isn't there anything good settler colonialism did? Or like, can't we talk about some of the good stuff about settler colonialism? And I am old enough now that I just go, nope, there is nothing good that said, there's just nothing, I'm sorry. Um, and then they'll go into uh, anger and they will get mad at me. They'll be like, you don't like white people. You want this to, and they'll get mad at me. And then they will go into sadness. And they will sort of be like, now I'm very sad. And I still, to this day, will get emails from random people that are just like, I mourn the loss of Native people and all every day. And I carry that with me. And I was wondering what right back, like, cool. Are you going to give your land back? Like, what are you going to do about it? Um, and so then they, my goal with them is I tell them, recognize that you're going through this process. Like, take a moment and be like, oh, I'm in the anger process, right? And then, like, move forward, acknowledge what's happening, and then realize, like, we don't want you to get stuck in sadness. Like, you're going to learn a lot, and you'll get there. We don't want you to be stuck in sadness. We want you to go to, like, the last stage of grief, which for me is action. Like, what are you going to do about it? now that you know. And so they start to be able, like, I want everybody who's listening to recognize if your first response is denial or anger or bargaining or sadness, you are moving through these stages that you need to get through so you can finally do action. And everybody goes through it. So don't feel like, but what I will also say is it's a very interesting thing to be an indigenous person, teaching this to people, watching them go through it, and then expecting me to take on all that grief for them and like drag them through it. They don't feel like a responsibility to do it themselves. I will tell you this, don't expect me to do that for you. Do that for yourself. But also when you're thinking about it, like think about it as this is something that I've been conditioned for and now I'm unconditioning myself and I'm going to I'm going to give myself over to that process. That's what has to happen as you move through those stages. Thank you so much for that. Uh, yeah, I think this has been a really productive conversation. This is 1051 Care of H. We're going to take a quick break and we will be right back. This is 1051 Care of H, and you're listening to Debate in the News for uh, recorded on Sun no Friday, uh, Friday, June 26, 2020. I'm Ayrton Flaherty. Joining me via Zoom is my co-host, Dr. Aaron Donaldson. Hey, Ayrton, it's great to be back here in the studio. And once again, we've got a really wonderful panel of guests uh, talking to us about settler colonialism and decolonization um, for this episode. We'd like once again to just give you all a chance to introduce yourself to our listeners. Uh, and again, we'll start with you, Dr. Rislingbaldi, just real briefly. Hey, everyone, Dr. Kutcher Rislingbaldi, Hoopa Yark and Karuk, enrolled in the Hoopa Valley Tribe and the Department Chair of Native American Studies at Humboldt State. Are you clean? I'm Caitlin Reed. I'm an assistant professor of Native American studies at Humboldt State. I'm a Yurok, Kupa, and Oneida, and I'm enrolled in the Yurok tribe. Hey, I'm Kile, Kayla Begay, um, Native American studies assistant professor, Humboldt State, uh, background in linguistics. I'm an enrolled Hoopa Valley tribal member uh, with grandparents also enrolled in the Yurok and Kutuk tribes. Well, thank you all very much for joining us. We really appreciate you taking your time uh, to talk to us about this today. We just spent about 45 minutes talking about settler colonialism. And in that conversation, we talked about how easy it is to get distracted on the past and to just kind of talk about everything that has happened and what's occurred. And um, now we're going to touch on this conversation called decolonization, uh, which Tuck and Yang have famously written is not a metaphor. It is something that we're supposed to be doing. It's supposed to be a kind of a practice. Um, I was wondering if you folks could talk just very briefly about maybe what decolonization means within your own particular research, um, not only with regards to the kinds of practices that you, you know, look at and talk about, um, but also with regards to some of the intersections maybe that it has with white supremacy. We talked a lot in the first section about the way that settler colonialism and white supremacy are kind of intricately linked. Um, we talked a lot about how like you folks deal with a lot of fragility and blowback, particularly from white space uh, when we talk about this. 
um, I think some of that is kind of implicated. I know this is a very open-ended question. So once again, decolonization, what does it mean as a practice? Um, how, where do you see it intersecting in your research with white supremacy? Any of that that you folks would like to take on would be great. For me, I think decolonization is about the, the return of land uh, and life uh, to indigenous peoples in a way that understands that in order for us to move forward in this world in any way, um, we are going to need to disrupt, dismantle, and take apart this settler colonial system because it is not working. It's not logical. It's not inventive. It's not supportive. It's really not anything for anyone except for like the top you know, 1% of billionaires who maybe would say it's working, but I would still argue it's not working because most of them are jerks. And so if it creates a bunch of jerks, I think that's not working. Um, and I know that we can envision a world that is a lot better, that works. And I always am talking to people like decolonization for me is, is looking at how do we make a world that actually works, not just for us as human beings, but our more than human relatives, that works in a way where we can feel good about ourselves and our futures. And to me, when we think about our roles in that, we were always like philosophizing and envisioning like what decolonization is from the very beginning. You can look at some of our old stories, our very old stories that are saying, at points in our existence, we will have things that come and try to destroy this land, but we have the tools to push back against that in our culture and our ceremonies, in the ways that we do things. So we've always been given the methodologies of decolonization, the methodologies to create a world that makes sense. And when Tuck and Yang are talking about decolonization not being a metaphor, what they're saying is that people will often say, I, I do decolonization or I'm participating in decolonization because I'm decolonizing my bookshelf, right? And I'm reading more people of color. And what they're trying to let people know is like, well, that's not decolonization. That's a good idea. Like we should read people of color. We should read different books. We should actually do that. But unless you're like going to give your, your bookshelf back to the WIAT, uh, that's that's what decolonization is. This is like a step toward this movement. And we have to be mindful of that because when people are like, I'm decolonizing my syllabus, I'm decolonizing my mind, I'm decolonizing my garden, like that's a good thing to do. That's a step. That is not what we're thinking about when we're thinking about what does liberation look like for people in this world, right? Like what does liberation look like of water? We in prison in water right now. And what does that look like? What does it look like when the salmon are healthy? What does the world look like when we can all breathe? So that to me is where decolonization is going is like, let's start to think about what that world could be. And that's something else. That's not capitalism. That's not uh, settler colonialism. That's not private property, like that's something else. And it's time for us to start understanding that we have the tools, we have the space in our brains, in our stories, to have that conversation and to build something better. Um, and I, and so when people come to me and they're like, oh, that's a really cool idea, Caitlin, but like quit, you're so like optimistic and that's never going to happen. My argument is like one, it already is. Um, but two, like their settler colonial society is not sustainable. Like, we cannot continue to live in this way that we always have. And so, like, the way I try to frame decolonization for people is, like, it is going to happen because your society is going to collapse. It is going to crumble. It's whether we begin, like, working towards these goals of dismantling oppressive structures, like, while we have the agency to make that decision. Um, and so my work is focused within like indigenous environmental studies. And so I really try to appeal to the environmentalist in a lot and like, right, there's this whole, whole background of white supremacy that uh, drives the American environmental movement, but um, put that on pause for a moment. Studies show that when you return lands to native peoples, ecological restoration dramatically increases, right? Because native peoples have a complex and sophisticated knowledge of how places work, but they are also in relationship to those places through ceremony, through culture, through song, and all of these things, right? And so there's an obligation to take care of that place that, like, capitalist settler culture is never, like, 
yeah, there are some environmentalists in settler society, but I would argue there's a lot of problematic elements to their type of like politicized environmentalism as well. But like decolonization is really for everybody because uh, so one thing I've, I've heard people say that I really like is that settler knowledge, specifically environmental knowledges of our places is so young. Um, somebody likened it to a toddler who thinks they know all the things, right, which we can totally see if we talk to environmental scientists on campus. But to be able to return to a system that Native peoples had figured out, right, instead of like, why are we eating like meat, like factory farmed, right, in California? Like if we actually didn't divert all of our water for cannabis and big agriculture, we would have enough fish to feed everybody, right? Um, and so like de by returning land to native peoples, we can begin to reinstate ecological relationships that have been practiced for like so long that makes like the, the the 170 years that people settlers have been in california it looks like a blink of an eye in comparison right and like the earth is so ready for us to like return to the ways she's supposed to be taken care of um and so i try to make the argument that like a hey, decolonization is good for everybody because you're ruining the in the world right like and so in some ways i think about settler colonialism as cannibalism because you're destroying all the things you need to stay alive and so decolonization will help people stay alive longer <laughs> but i want to i want to add to that for people is like and this is something indigenous peoples are constantly pointing out is we are always people are saying that's a good dream how is that ever going to happen that's going to take forever but in reality uh settler colonialism isn't that old it really hasn't been here that long and there are people who i mean we very much already have memories and people that we knew who could talk about a time before Settler, so it's not that old. It's not. It hasn't been around that long. And so the idea that it's just exist in existence in perpetuity. I mean, that's it's a fallacy to think about how short this period of time has actually been. So we will know after it. We will know post. And things change all the time. So I think we have to remind ourselves like this is not a set state of how things have to be. And if we can start to make those things happen, to envision those things happening, then they're going to happen. It's possible. So your question was uh, decolonization, what it might mean not only for research, but also for individual behaviors or practices, right? So I think first and foremost, yes, decolonization is not a metaphor, right? But I think there's steps and stages to get there. And I think that, um, for example, you know, movements to give back the land are often preceded by movements to reclaim names of places. And we see that with, for example, Tuluwat. I did not grow up hearing that word um, on the coast or inland. It was the other names for those islands uh, kind of circulating in the community, even among Native people at the time, different Native communities. But um, because people kept telling that story and kept calling it Tuluwat, that spread, that movement, and um, eventually, you know, telling that the, the story of that place brought it back, right? People decided decolonization to an extent with, with bringing that land back, giving the land back, right? So I just want to point that out that um, I think as far as language goes, um, this concept of reclaiming domains or reclaiming spaces, reclaiming land names is, is often a, a, is a step in that process. Um, but again, decolonization is not a metaphor. And then um, I also think that decolonization as Native peoples, um, you know, we in our own healing, um, can look to our languages for those things that can, can heal us, whether it's, you know, um, food systems, uh, our own spirituality and religion. Uh, we, that language is often a pathway towards our own healing. And we see this in studies, I think, that um, uh, physical health can be impacted by connection to your language and to other parts of the knowledge system in connection to that. There's emerging studies regarding that and that, um, you know, connecting with your language, for example, and maybe prayer, uh, you recognize tobacco in a way that is, it's a spiritual item and not just this addictive thing, for example. And people who are more connected to language or have, have lower smoking rates, for example. Something really simple like that. Um, return of indigenous life, right? Uh, is it safe to speak your indigenous language in the community? Um, 
or any language that is in English, right? Because that's a part of the hegemony and, and a part of settler violence is that, you know, you see people, if they're in public, you know, you're speaking your language, are you going to get accosted in the, in the store? <laughs> um, talking to your children, right? I think we're doing a better job of filming what's called the Karens, right? <laughs> or other folks when they're being violent or going to bring violence on people, um, indigenous, black, indigenous people of color. But uh, we're not there yet if people don't feel safe speaking their indigenous languages in their own homelands. I think that one of the most important things um, for, you know, white folks, for folks that don't have a direct connection with a lot of these legacies that you're talking about besides their existence as kind of settler participants that that you know decolonization means for us is a simple thing that a lot of people take very personally they get really upset about it but we all believe it's an important thing which is just listening like it's taken me a while i'm ashamed to admit to learn that one of the most important things i can do is just stop talking and just try to listen to what folks are telling me and especially if i get upset especially if right away i get mad I've used that kind of first stage of grief that we talked about last segment to be a clue. If someone's talking about my history, my government, my sports team in a way that is making me angry, debate, frankly, has taught me that that's probably fragility somewhere, and that person's probably right, and my job is to listen and to think about that. And, and so while decolonization can take on all these different kinds of you know, processes and practices, one of the ones that was important for me to learn was just that you know, you kind of have to be quiet sometimes and just listen to what folks have to say. Um, Ayrton, I know you had a particular question you wanted to get to about like giving back the land and whatnot. Yeah. Um, so I was kind of, so I was kind of wondering, like, I mean, there are specific policies that like, like what type of, like, I mean, like what type of policies like can we, uh, can we enact uh, like, or at least organizations that are, that are being set up to kind of fight the uh, fight, for decolonization, like uh, we brought uh, Caitlin, uh, Caitlin Reed and a, a few other NAS students to talk about like the Food Sovereignty Lab. Um, but like, what else is there? Like, I mean, like Humble has a complex history about giving back the land. So like, what other, pro what other processes are there into that regard our region in that? I mean, I like the idea of working for land return and however, whenever you're going to do it. Um, I think it has to become, I've discovered in the work that I do that we need to start saying things out loud that we might not think are possible, but that would be righteous to do. That would just be freaking amazing if they happened. And because nothing can become until we speak it into being, like we have to start imagining it as a possibility. Um, I actually learned that from The Simpsons. Uh, I was watching this episode of The Simpsons and they were like back in um, Game of Thrones time and they and Lisa was trying to lead a revolution against the king and she went to Homer and she was like, come on, you got to come and be a part of this revolution. We're going to take down this system. We're going to change everything. And he was like, he looked at her and he goes, Lisa, feudalism is just the way that it is. It's the way that it's always going to be. What's the point in doing what you're doing? Because this is how we live. And I was like, yeah, like when they're in the middle of it, it feels like this is it. And they can't think, Homer can't think beyond feudalism because it's the life that he lives. And yet we're all sitting there like feudalism. No, that's going to end like in a couple of years. Like we're all, you know, like now we're into this like weird capitalism, settler colonialism game. Right. And then we act like that's permanent, that that's forever. And that it's not something that we can just start to imagine as different and push back against as different. So I think any way you're going, to, you're going to do that, it needs to become the thing that you say out loud. And when I, when I talk to organizations, I'm like, look, at some point, you will come up against something. It'll be like somebody wants to donate a bunch of land to you so you can do something with your nonprofit. Well, why don't you just give that back to indigenous peoples and then work with them to do something with your nonprofit? Like why, you know what I mean? Like where, where becomes the whole part where we just start going like, nah, this is possible. And I know it's possible. I know it's possible for people to give back their backyards. I've seen it and heard it happening. I know it's possible for companies to give back land. I've seen that happening. I know, I've known of individuals who have given back, given back land. So I know it's possible. I know it's already happened. And then we look in our own region 
you watch as they return, you know, a portion of Tuluat to the Wiat tribe. And you know it's possible. So when people come to me and they're like, land return, what does that even look like? I always go, like this. And I play a video of the return of Tuluat. And yes, that took decades to happen. But I think what we have to sign up for is that work. We always have to be signed up for that work. And so it has to come from people really on an organic level, just constantly being the person in the room that will raise their hand and be like, ooh, what about land return? Ooh, what about indigenous peoples? Ooh, what about if we did this? And I can name organizations throughout Humboldt County that I would be like, do you have an indigenous person on your land trust? Do you have an indigenous tribal connection for the work that you're doing in your communities? Because if you don't, then what are you doing? They should be there in the room. We have people that can do all of that. So if we're not being invited, don't think like that that's okay. Like we should be in all of those spaces. If you have land somewhere, if why I always say to people, why aren't indigenous peoples a majority of the coastal commission in California? We should be. We're the ones with the longest knowledge and history of the coast, but yet get try to look at what it would look like for us to be a majority of the coastal commission what does it look like for us to be a majority of what's happening on boards in different organizations what does it look like for us to be a majority of like the land trust that we like support so much in this region so anything that you're going to do especially if it has to do with land conservation research right like anything it's you need to think about the role of indigenous peoples in that. And it can come, it can come from policy, but it's really got to come from saying, we are going to not uphold a system that silences these voices. We're going to center these voices in what we do. And there's nothing wrong with that. Centering indigenous voices doesn't mean that it's not going to work for everybody. It actually is going to work for everybody because that should have been the way that it was in the first place. So a part of decolonization, if it hasn't already been said, is that it, um, centers indigenous frameworks and centers indigenous people and indigenous people's relationships to land. Um, and so your question, you know, thinking about how to support, uh, I, I'm thinking about the fact that we now have indigenous languages being taught in the local high schools, not all of them, and not all the local schools, but what that's doing, um, there's, emerging studies are not published yet but people are working on this it's creating safe places for other people of color but to take those indigenous language classes where other um, non-white folks um, can reflect on their own heritage and their own indigenous language or, or mother languages and feel pride about that even though it's you know in a classroom and it's centered on an indigenous um, language such as such as Yurok or, or uh, hoopa, et cetera, karuk. Um, but it also does something and transforms the thinking of the non-people um, of color, the, the Euro-American students, for example, to realize, wow, we're not the center of the world, <laughs> you know? And, and it makes it more easy then to understand these, these relationships that we're talking about, to, to study even briefly some basics and supporting indigenous languages and their growth. So one of the other things I think about, because I, I think about the transmission um, of knowledge and transmission of, of language, you know, because for a long time it wasn't allowed to happen, just wasn't, you know, from parents to child, right? Now we're having a lot of young people uh, speaking to their children and bringing their children up in the language to the best of their ability. It can do a lot for that child, just for someone, even if they're not, Kupa, not Iraq, not Karuk, not Win, um, Wiat or Wintu, for example, just to know some basic stuff and greetings <laughs> to not make that child feel alone in that. And um, so to center Indigenous people, I can think of a lot of ways to center Indigenous peoples <laughs> and, and it can be an eye-opening thing to support language. And I also, I want to add to that, like, I want people to consider when they're starting to say, like, what can we do? What about, what, like, what do we do? To consider why it is that like, um, it's always our, let's say, cause we're all from the Native American Studies Department, right, at Humboldt State. But when we're looking at this period of time where people are like, budgets are tight, we don't quite know what we're gonna do. It's always our departments, it's always our work 
that is the first to be questioned about if it fits the role of what is needed in higher education. It's always the the bills that are saying everybody has to take an ethnic studies class that we spend the most time debating. If we know that that's the case, why, if people want to do something, then support our work. Like be the people that are willing to put up the money and the time and the effort. Tell your kids that they have to major or in Native American studies, like acknowledge that that space is really important not just for you, but because you are showing support of work that has been silenced and degraded and left out of the conversation, like you have to step up to do that. And it is, it is a responsibility to show that that is an important part of what a university education is. And you can do that simply by saying, I'm going to major in Native American studies, period. Because I know that not only do I want to learn all of this, not only will it be good for me, but it's going to show that because this system for 500 years has been set up to silence us, we don't want them to be silenced. So like step up and do that actual work too, because right now what you see is we're always the ones having to defend our role in this. And yet we're also the ones that people rely on to create better scientists and social workers and psychologists. And they're like, nobody knows how to talk about this unless they've taken all these classes. So do the work, do the actual work to show support for what we do. And whatever major you are in, or if like, if you're a academic, whatever field you are in, indigenous peoples have been infiltrating the academy for a long time. Like read up on the ways in which your, your discipline has interacted with indigenous peoples historically the ways they've used indigenous knowledges and go and read what indigenous scholars in your discipline are saying about your discipline and how it needs to improve to work for native peoples right like we've done a lot of this work already and it's like but i always think of the phrase like you can't lead a horse to like you can lead a horse to water and you can't make him drink it's like we've done so much of this work right and it's like read something, right? Like, uh, Kaja always says in her talks, like, Linda T. Smith wrote Decolonizing Methodologies 20 years ago. Like, read a damn book. <laughs> I think the question itself is just indicative, right? Where, and it speaks too to something we spoke of in the first segment where it's like, they out, we, we tend to outsource that labor. We, we make it something that it's a class that I'm going to take. And I'm going to sit down and talk with the teacher and say, will you tell me what this is? And I'm like, but if it's something that is very meaningful and significant to us, we just can't get enough of it. We can't, you know, we, we find the books and we go out and we track it down and we make it a priority. And I think that, um, you know, one of the things that's remarkable to me is how, as you've said in the first segment, how little people know about just the history. And, you know, students are like, well, what can we do? And I'm like, I don't know, just care about history. Like, just, just care a little about some of the most amazing history that has ever happened that you were never told because strategically it was being erased and that helps and just be a little bit more aware of what's going on. Um, right. Um, if I can add on to that, like please, I've been yeah. thinking about this a lot lately. Like we have a chronic problem of like uneducated people. Like we have a lot of people with degrees, like they have degrees for days. We have a lot of uneducated people and like, and like people get sad when they're like, Oh, I didn't learn all these things. Right. This is a systemic problem. Right, like think like let's think for a minute, like who is on school boards writing curricula, approving and like what deals they have with textbook companies, but like who's approving the material that gets put into classes, right? Um, and so like like I meet like people that are like really smart, um, but like know nothing, right, about like the the world in which they are doing their work, right? And so like we have this prioritization of like, check all the boxes, get the degree, make some money, but like nobody is educated in this country. <laughs> like it feels like. I don't know. I'm teaching foundations of my discipline for the first time in the fall, uh, foundations of communication. And you know, it was this interview and this conversation that I revisit, I tried to as regularly as I can, that prompted me to think like, what, what are indigenous communications? Like there has to be. So I go to Google and I'm like indigenous communications and lo and behold, here's all these books that have been written that have been sitting quietly on shelves, just waiting for people to read them and being read obviously by lots of people. Um, the work is definitely out there. And you know, we spoke about how much knowledge is available for us. And I think that a lot of it has to do with attitude. I think that it is less that the work doesn't exist and that it's hidden. It's just that kind of resilient belief that 
that we know what's real and that it is not this history that we have been told. Do any of you folks have any thoughts? We didn't really prep this question, but I just kind of wanted to throw it out there. As, as someone who studies debate and argumentation, I think the attitude you bring into the debate is the most important part of that debate. If they come in insisting that you have nothing to offer, then they're going to be right. And one of the phrases I use a lot is, if you insist, if you insist, if you insist, this will be true. What kind of resp Do you think the, the attitudes to talking about this are getting better? Do you think people are more willing to have these conversations? Or what kinds of um, things do you think could be valuable for people to, to take into these conversations to just kind of address that known blowback? It is studied. There are literally stages of grief that people have come up with. We know this is the way people are going to respond. I don't feel like it's getting better, but I don't want to speak for you all. Um, and either way, you know, what kind of thoughts do you have about addressing those kinds of negative attitudes that people bring with them? Um, Aaron, your question has me thinking about like course evaluations as part of like the tenure process and like, yeah, people in my class liked me and wrote some nice things, but like, that's not where my mind stays. Right. And so like the, the one I like wrote about recently is that my class is propaganda. Um, and yeah, um, I can like address it and stuff, but, um, in other things, but I think what that speaks to is that there are very few departments and courses on campus that get very in depth and talk about white supremacy and the centrality of white supremacy in the creation of the United States. Right. And so in those courses and like our department is like fully staffed by indigenous women, right? Like we get the brunt of that aggression. Right. And at times it can be dangerous. Like there are situations where indigenous women in the classroom have received death threats because of the way they talk about white supremacy and settler colonialism in the classroom, right? And so it's not just like, oh, my performance might get like a little ding because I had a, I got unlucky to have a clump of white supremacists in my classroom, but like this is actually like can turn into physical endangerment, and it's like it's really an emotional labor to like have to educate a group of white supremacists about settler colonialism. Right. And that's like, like I 90% of the time, right. My students are incredibly excited to learn about this material that they were like, um, censored from in their public education and like want to use the information they get in our classes to go and like do work the work that they want to do in a better way in a way that services indigenous communities but like like white like we can see from the news white supremacy is alive and well it would be naive to assume that no white supremacists ever walk our campus or walk into our classrooms and so like the the relationships that we have to have with these students and what i've found in my first year as a professor here at humboldt state is that there are a lot of um administrative like avenues to protect students from like situations they may find uncomfortable there are no methods of protection for faculty of color for indigenous faculty on campus that have to deal with white supremacy in the classroom and like I do it for like the people who walk away wanting to like use this information, but like we can't deny the reality that like we get white supremacists in our class and it sucks. <laughs> I think it comes back to what Kutcha had said at one of the beginning um, discussions here was that you can talk all day about our humanity, but you, you kind of get tired of that argument. Right. <laughs> and at some point, you know, um, we can give all this information and that's often our jobs, right? But at the same time, um, people have to be accepting of that. People have to, to believe that. <laughs> and there's a point in which maybe you might just say it, something matters because it matters to us. I, I have learned in my time teaching that I came to uh, teaching in a way that, because I loved it and I loved what I could do with students and I, I loved the interaction. Um, but I realized that I had been taught to actually center um, white students in the classroom because I was always thinking about their experience and like I'm talking to them as if they are the centered group of people that I'm supposed to be educating and everybody else in that room uh, needs to sort of be there to help support these white students to learn and sort of like help them to get on board with these 
like structural comments or liberation or decolonization. And I realized that what we do when we do that is we take all of the, we take all of that and then that is a toll on the other students in the classroom. They don't ever get to be centered. Their conversations don't get to be centered. Their methodologies, their ways of knowing what they want to do, how they want to speak about the things that we're reading or learning about don't get to be centered because we're always centering this experience of like, no, this is about the person who knows very little, who who might be resistant, who we're trying to get to sort of move into this direction. That's who I'm teaching to. I have stopped doing that. I've started to say, it is not, I'm not coming into this space to center students who are like, I'm resistant to this conversation. I'm actually coming into this space to center students who are like, I'm ready. What are we going to do? How are we going to change the world? And I'm like, yeah, let's have that conversation. Because there are hundreds of books there are YouTube videos, there are podcasts, there are radio shows. You can do all kinds of stuff. If you want to learn the basic reason why you should treat us like human beings and why you should understand like what this world's supposed to look like, if you want to have that, go for it. Go for it. I encourage you to do all of that. I want to have the next conversation now. We need to be there. And so when I teach these classes, I'm always saying, like, I know there's a bunch of you right now that are going through your settler stages of grief. Be there. Think about it. Reflect. Don't think it is our job to help you through that. That's your job. Now we're going to have a conversation about what happens next because we for so long have not been the people centered in that conversation. And, that, and that's the only way we're going to get out of this. The only way we're going to solve climate change is with that conversation. The only way we're going to move past racism is with that conversation. The only way we're going to have a future where everybody can breathe is with that conversation. So we have to stop centering white fragility and white students as the students in the classroom and to think about, nah, we're ready to now push like what we're going to do. And I think it has actually helped because I, it has helped students to see, no, I have to do the work. Like, I have to do the work, too. I can't just rely on people to sort of help me do that work. And I would just say that um, Black, Indigenous, people of color, students of uh, color don't just exist in the classroom to educate their white peers, because that can happen sometimes. And I think that sometimes is how some of us felt, you know, going through undergrad, you know, different universities. It's like we had to do the work of educating both the teacher and the <laughs> other students when that happens, when they're centered and, and in some ways you're like, well, that's, that's how the world's structured. I guess that prepares you for the world, but no, like we're wanting different, right? We want a different experience for our students. Yeah. One of the phrases I've used a lot is with my students is like to remind themselves that they're behind on a conversation. Uh, you know, we're brought up thinking that if you don't know what's going on or if you use the word ignorant or whatever, that's supposed to be an insult. But there's a lot of things I'm ignorant about, and I'll just own that. And when I admit to being ignorant, then that puts me in a place of being behind and needing to catch up, and that puts the onus on me. And people don't like to acknowledge their ignorance. They don't want to admit that they're ignorant. They think it's an insult to be ignorant. And what's worse is people have this tremendous sense of pride for this history that was concocted, largely manufactured, strategically designed for the sake of erasing what exists. We're broadcasting this during the week of the 4th of July. We're leading up to the you know celebration of America's founding and all of this. Um, Ayrton has a question that he just chatted me about, like projects that we could promote kind of within the region, and we want to make sure we get a chance to talk about that. If there's anything particular you'd like to cue our listeners into, I just wanted to create a little bit of space real quickly, if we could, to kind of talk about like the, everything we love about America in many cases comes from indigenous nations. The notions of liberty, like this, this natural state of man, we kind of touched on all of that, right? There is a way we can celebrate the good parts of this country without being prideful and boastful of a history of genocide. Um, it, are in, do, do any of you folks have like anything you'd like to contribute on that just with regards to like, you know, we have to be accountable to our history. We have to take ownership of what it is. That doesn't mean we can't celebrate the things that have created the stuff that we care about that has come, come from these places. Does that make sense? 
tiptoeing around and apologetic, I think. I don't want to step up to my um, knee. Native uh, founding scholar, Native American Studies, Vine Deloria Jr., um, he wrote in one of his, like, I don't know, 30 books, um, he wrote that uh, patriotism is actually like this deep, deep desire to become indigenous to place, right? And so like, kind of recognizing why we're enacting patriotism on this day. But um, also I think if like people want to be super proud to be American and like celebrate that, give land back. Like that's something to be super proud about, right? You educated yourself about your genocidal history and like work to rectify it. Like that is something people can take pride in, right? And so like, I think people here, like, we should, settlers should be super proud that they returned to the lot. They still have a lot of land to return, right? But they can be proud that they returned that piece. And so, like, if we want to celebrate, like, things America has done, like, like, like let's do the right thing, and then we'll celebrate that, right? <laughs> so I think we should do more things at which we can be proud. I, 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 I get a lot of information about how the world feels about things from my teenage daughter, um, and I asked her, like, why do we celebrate the 4th of July? And she just looked at me and was like, I don't know, fireworks? Like, I don't know how much the young people have invested themselves in, like, the pridefulness of the United States as this celebration. Um, I, because that, that's what happens, right? Like, we, ele we, we put these things into this realm of, like, uh, elevating them, putting them on pedestals, and then they lose all the messaging that was there in the first place. Um, and that's what happens with statues. That's what happens with everything, right? It's like they just lose sort of the elements of why they were there in the first place. Um, I will say this, like, I also kind of then had to go Google, like, why do we celebrate the 4th of July? Like, because, and even though I would fancy myself a bit of a historian, I was like, wait, what is that really about? Um, because, like, again, this idea of, like, it just becomes this kind of mechanism of, like, going out and lighting off fireworks and, American flags. I don't know what, you know what I mean? Um, so I think people need to remember that like, if they're so caught up in this idea of like, well, we want the 4th of July. We just, that's what we really want. And this idea of like letting it go is going to be, then they need to know why they need to be able to express that for real. They need to do that work to be able to have that conversation. Cause if it's just cause I like fireworks and hot dogs, like, well, we can designate a lot of other things to use to celebrate with fireworks and hot dogs. We could also then start talking about how fireworks are really bad for the environment. You know what I mean? Like we start talking about like all these kinds of things, but the idea being like, don't come at me with, well, no, this like, we got to have some, look, we can celebrate good things about the 4th of July. If I'm like, well, then what are you celebrating? Like, what is it that you're actually doing? And if you can't answer that very basic fundamental question, then really it isn't about the 4th of July. It is about this sort of white supremacist narrative of you can't tell me what to do because you're taking apart the narrative that I have internalized about why we're supposed to be doing this. So I'm asking people to start to think like, well, why do we? And I'm not going to give you the answer because I did Google it, but I'm not going to give you the answer. Okay, so Declaration of Independence, right? 1776. <laughs> Let's just acknowledge that really quick. <laughs> but what the conversations I've been having over the week you know because that's coming up it's like oh my god we're in covid right and are people is this going to be super spreader events and people blowing stuff up and it's like okay what does that say about us you know as americans if we put on that hat but um the other thing is just uh, i think the conversations i've been having about the week and that particular day um people seem to think like history started with the united states like that's where we start like right there <laughs> even with colonization like there um Indigenous peoples by 1776 were dealing with Euro Europeans, right? European settlers for hundreds of years at that point. And there's a whole lot to talk about before that even and what that looked like. And was it always, you know, what the way we see it today? Um, yeah. <laughs> so those are the conversations I've been having, not... Um, I don't even, we haven't even talked about fireworks. Honestly, it's like everything else. Like we're not going out. We're going to not be super spreaders and probably not going to blow stuff up. So, so as we wrap up this conversation, um, are there any organizations or projects that you, uh, that any of you would like to promote, uh, like that are local to H humble or something happening in California or, or nationally? Well, I, I mean, I'll begin with, I want to just, 
remind everyone who's listening that all of us are professors at Humboldt State University in the Native American Studies Department. The Native American Studies Department at Humboldt State is the oldest Native American Studies Department in the CSU, and this year we celebrated our 25th anniversary. Um, and I think for a number of years, the department, you know, had to really struggle against a system that did not want it to succeed and has been able to be a successful and leading department in Native American studies, especially in the CSU. Uh, and now, because of that hard work that has happened over a number of years, we have three PhD California indigenous women scholars, you know, at the sort of like helm of this department. That's also unheard of. But what's also unheard of is that Humboldt State itself also then has additional PhD indigenous women scholars in different departments across campus. Plus we have Native American peoples who are as staff who are serving at Humboldt State. And I'm saying like, we are a hub of Native American excellence, uh, especially in California. And it's not something that I think Humboldt talks enough about is like all the things that they have in the Native American studies program in Native American peoples. But what I also like to remind people is like, we as Native American peoples in this region in, in Humboldt County, we are we number six to ten like six to seven percent of this population is native. That's unheard of in California. We're usually like just below two percent. Six to seven percent is native. And we send generations of our families to Humboldt State. We are on third and fourth generations of people that are going to Humboldt State because of how important this area is to us and like what we can do. So we need to think about centering indigenous peoples and in how we understand our university and our school should not be unheard of. In fact, it should be something that we think is fundamental to what we're gonna do at HSU. And so if you want to support the Native American Studies Program, you can always give us money uh, donate things to us, like te like show actual support, because what we get to use we get to use that when things come up for us, where people are like, well, I don't know, do we need a Native American Studies Department? And then we get to be like, yeah, we do. And also, the community wants this. This is something that people support. So I always say to people like, you don't know what to do now? Well, give me money. Like, give us money. Get on the internet and give us money and start there. And it can be as little as a dollar fifty. I got, in, I got in a donation for $5 the other day. It made my whole day because it means somebody cares enough about us to think I want to support you. And there's so many things that we could do with that if people can show their support for what we do. Well, we really just want to thank all three of you for joining us. This has been an absolutely outstanding episode. Um, thanks, you all, for taking your time and coming on. So this is 151, Kara FH. You've been listening to Debate and News. Happy 4th of July. If it's if it's on if this is airing on july 4th and go jacks debate in the news is a co-production between the departments of communication and journalism and mass communication that's com 110 and jmc 155 in the college of arts humanities and social sciences at humboldt state university in beautiful arcata california you can learn more about debate and speech at humboldt state by contacting the team on twitter or instagram that's at hsu debate you can participate yourself by enrolling in com 110 this fall Today's show featured the following songs, USA Holes by No Effects, Land Back by A Tribe Called Red, Boogie the Beat, and Northern Voices, White War by Frank Wallen, A Song for Mosin by Fawn Wood and Alan DePerna, Black Snakes by A Tribe Called Red featuring Prolific the Rapper, Black Snakes by Marie Sue, What Makes the Red Man Red by Frank Wallen, Hop to the Drop, Crow Hop by Northern Cree, This is Mortals by Wario. We would like to thank our guests from the Department of Native American Studies at Humboldt State University, Dr. Kutcher Risling Baldy, Dr. Caitlin Reed, and Dr. Caleb Gay. Debate in the News was created and is produced by Ayrton Flair and Dr. Aaron Donaldson. Today's episode was edited by Ayrton Flaherty. Our logo was created by Sydney Verga. You can contact us on Gmail by addressing hsudebateradio at gmail.com or by tweeting to at hsudebateradio. We would like to thank Cliff Berkowitz for supporting radio programming at Humboldt State during the shelter in place and order and thank you for listening to Debate and the News. Please continue physical distancing and listening to Radio Free Humboldt every day. We grow good radio.